A city government transparency law has been ignored for 25 years, not anymore thanks to persistent reporters. Republican Congressman Darrell Issa and Duncan Hunter Jr. met some pretty rowdy constituents at public forums. The Navy's Fat Leonard bribery scandal ensnares more brass, including another admiral and a quartet of captains. And downtown, several luxury apartments are being illegally marketed as vacation rentals. I'm Mark Sauer. The KPBS Roundtable starts now. Welcome to our discussion of the week's top stories. I'm Mark Sauer, and joining me at the KPBS Roundtable today, reporter Lori Weisberger covers marketing and tourism for the Union Tribune. Hi, Lori. Hi, good to be here. Good to see you today. Reporter Brad Racino of iNewsource. Hi, Brad. Hey, Mark. Good to have you back today. Greg Moran, who covers legal affairs for the Union Tribune. Hi, Greg. Hey, Mark. Good to see you. And reporter Joshua Stewart, also of the San Diego Union Tribune. Hi, Joshua. Hi, Mark. Well, few ballot initiatives ever got this kind of support. In 1992, 86% of San Diego voters backed a measure calling for those doing business with the city to be clearly identified and to state the precise nature of their city involvement. But in 25 years, that law has never been enforced. Uh, Brad, start with some history. How did this uh, law come about back then? This law started because in 1992, the city wanted to do uh, a real estate transaction, $47 million to buy affordable housing. Uh, one of the city council members wanted to know who they were doing business with, and he was not getting a prompt answer. So he did some digging on his own and found that the person was allegedly the second highest ranking member of the mafia. And that created a lot of problems <laughs> after, after that. And, and because of that, he and the, the mayor agreed that that should never happen again. Mm -hmm. The city should just know who they're doing business with. And that's how it started. So that's the rationale. We ought to know who we're doing business with, who's involved in these organizations, and if there's anything nefarious going on. Yeah. Public ought to know. Just like you would do in private business. Okay. Now, <clears throat> excuse me, what did the, the 1992 law, what did it specifically mandate? It, well, it's a pretty short law. It's only four paragraphs and long. We'll and talk about that. Yeah, that led to part of the problem. But the, the main point of it is that it requires, for any kind of transaction, real estate, contracts, leases, requires a full and complete disclosure of the name and identity of any and all persons directly or indirectly involved in that transaction and the precise nature of all interests of all the parties therein. Okay, and that caused some problems because it's pretty open to interpretation when it's that that's short and specific. Right, it's, it's pretty vague, and that that came about. I mean, the vagueness was a problem almost immediately. There was uh, we found this memo from someone in the city to the city attorney saying, you know, how do we interpret this mm -hmm. thing? What does what does indirect interest mean? What does this mean? What does that mean? And that kind of started this chain reaction of city attorneys constantly having to try and clarify this thing. All right, we're going to jump back and forth in time a little bit. Here's new uh, uh, councilwoman Barbara Bree, hasn't been there very long. She's a bite here describing why she says we need to know who we are dealing with. If one day you're doing business with ABC Landscaping and it's owned by Joe and Jill and they do a bad job and you decide as a city you don't want to do business with them again, and the next day DEF Landscaping applies to do business with the city and it's still owned by Joe and Jill, um, you need to know that. All right, that's a benign example compared yeah. with uh, what we were talking about that, that actually caused this in the first place. But this was wildly popular with voters, right? As I said at the outset, it got a, a huge support. Yeah, there was no public opposition to it at all. I mean, everyone, I think, looked at it and said, yeah, it's common sense. We, mm -hmm. should, we should do this. 86% of voters approved of it. And that was 25 years ago. And off we go. So back then, the city attorney was John Witt, and he offers to go in and, and fix this vagueness you were talking about here and try to get some of these definitions to these things. And, and uh, what happened? He gave the, uh, the city council a, kind of a blueprint to proceed, yeah, right? Yeah, and he started what I, I call in the story a tradition among city attorneys of, <laughs> of doing this. They, they, all they can really do is offer their clarifying language and interpretations and give it to the council to do something with. So Witt did it, and then a few years later, um, Mike Aguirre did it, and then a few years later, Jan Goldsmith did it. Um, and here we are, and it's been three different people doing this. Well, it's hard to understand with all the financial woes and all the struggles the city had gone through here that so many businesses competing for city contracts, and, and give us a scope of this. How many, we're talking about a lot of money each We're year. talking about, I mean, we did the initial investigation of this last year, and the numbers were um, more than 1,000 companies doing more than $3 billion in business. All right, that's city. a heck of a lot of, yeah. a lot of dough. So why wasn't this embraced by city leaders, especially when, you know, there's so much financial woe and, and so much a call for transparency? It really depends on who you talk to. Um, if you talk to the skeptics, like Mike Aguirre, he says, this is, he had a great quote, he said, um, 
in San Diego, the government itself has been shaped by those who systematically abuse it. <laughs> and, and, that, and that there's layers of LLCs used to hide not only who's behind various projects, but where the money's coming from to influence people. So if you talk, talk to the skeptics, it's, they, they don't want to change things. If you talk to people um, inside the city, they say, well, you know, this is really hard to implement. Mm -hmm. um, you know, wh what's the cutoff? If a guy goes out and buys paper clips for the city, then do you have to know who the paper clip company owner mm -hmm. is and all their stockholders and things? So there's a, bit, a little bit of um, a hurdle to jump through when it comes to the logistics of implementing this thing. But if you just go back to the vote, I mean, this is a law. Mm -hmm. Voters wanted it, so. Mm -hmm. And it was there, and they overwhelmingly wanted it. Mm -hmm. I mean, couldn't you put some threshold, say, you know, the CEO and anybody who's handling X amount of dollars for our, a company uh, with this contract would be... Yeah, know, and, and those thresholds have been proposed. There's been, uh, in those city attorney memos to different council members, It's they've laid that out, 5%, 10% ownership. So, so I found it Lori? interesting that <coughs> in when you were, I guess, testing the law and, and seeking, seeking information, and in one case you were going to real estate assets and asked them for information, about some projects and their answer was, I'm sorry, we cannot be responsive to your request. And normally you think of that, oh, they're just stonewalling. Mm -hmm. They literally have no information. They themselves cannot find this information. Right, that's that's what they told us. And and after that last investig investigation, they said that they would start collecting that information. But that's just one department. I mean, that's real estate, which ha you know deals with yeah, millions of, of dollars, but then bit, you have yeah. purchasing and contracting, which is the billions of dollars. Right, now if they actually implemented this in a reasonable way, would it mean hiring a bunch more staff to get this information together? I, I honestly <laughs> don't know, I, I don't think so, as Barbara Bree said uh, in our interview, it, it literally requires one more line on a form, and you fill it out, and, and there it is. And as far as uh, the the implementation like online, it's not that hard to build a portal. The city's already been doing pretty well with their open data and things to, to get this stuff available for people to look through. It's a boom for reporters. All right. It'd be great for the A couple public. seconds left in this segment. What's happening now? The city council going to take this up? Are they going to try and finally implement it? Yeah, so the rules committee uh, took this up in last October and then just went away, and that's why we did this story again, saying what happened. Mm -hmm. And so it is scheduled, uh, it's on the docket for June for the rules committee to All bring right. back up. Well, we'll follow up with your reporting that time. Fascinating story. We're going to move on. Republican members of Congress in the Donald Trump era may want to forego their recess trips back home and stay in Washington. That's because Democratic protesters highly organized, motivated, loud and angry, are demanding public in-your-face meetings with GOP representatives. Both Daryl Issa in North County and Duncan Hunter in East County felt constituents' wrath recently. Uh, Josh, it was set the scenes for us. Start with um, uh, Daryl Issa. What was it like up at that meeting? Well, uh, by all accounts, it was uh, quite raucous. There was uh, several protesters that had showed up to come impress him and confront him about uh, various policies and items on the Trump agenda. Uh, he actually had two sessions because there was so much interest. There was one and then uh, right thereafter they cleared out uh, the community center and brought in the next wave of people. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, like at Republican events across the country, it's they've been confrontational. There's been some yelling uh, and shouting and, and accusations and Quite frankly, it's uh, you know these sorts of events have been some of the liveliest uh, that have occurred in a while. And same thing at uh, at uh, Duncan Hunter Jr.'s event there in East County, right? Uh, pr very similar. It was mm -hmm. probably uh, uh, from I was at uh, Hunter's and by talking to my colleagues, it seems like it was even more raucous at mm -hmm. Hunter's. Uh, when I was there, people were uh, closer than you and I are right now, yelling at each other, uh, practically able to smell what they had for breakfast, mm -hmm. and uh, you know <laughs> were throwing insults at each other as well as at the congressman. Um, the congressman, uh, to some extent, seemed to actually, uh, you know, enjoy it. Uh, he, you know, kept uh, he would go uh, some of the uh, critics by uh, singing uh, Queens, "We Are the Champions," uh, to uh, yeah. uh, you know get a little bit of a rise out of them. We won, get over it is kind of the, that. That was the message. The thing there, and yeah. again, there were some supporters there, but at each one, uh, as I understand from the reporting, the protesters outnumbered the supporters. Yes, and, and you know, uh, security uh, at uh, Hunters was out uh, in mass, both private security as well as around. Uh, 14 additional uh, sheriff deputies uh, just to keep things in line. Yeah. And you know, fortunately, I think uh, you know that the the most serious thing that anyone had to do is just tell people to cool off. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, what were some of the uh, the, the big uh, uh, issues, the things they wanted to confront these congressmen about? Healthcare was a big one. Uh, there was a lot of people that uh, do not want to see uh, the. Uh, uh, do not want to see Obamacare disappear. They are concerned about losing coverage or they're concerned about changes in uh, their premiums. So there's a lot of uh, uh, people demanding that there not be any sort of changes that would 
leave them without insurance. Some of the things they're hearing about in this so-called Trump care proposal here that's uh, struggling to get its way through the House, much less the Senate at this point. We do have a bite I want to set up here. ICE uh, has not really exactly been towing the House Republican line on he health care. Here's a clip from his town hall. I do not believe that we can strip away both employer and individual mandates and not find both a carrot and a stick to get people to be financially, fiscally responsible for their own decisions. Carrot and a stick, what's he, he mean? He's not happy with the bill, obviously. Yeah, uh, ISA says that uh, he can't support it in its current form, uh, but he hasn't said what particular matters within this bill he takes issue with, and he hasn't suggested uh, any sort of amendments that he would like to see occur. Uh, but, you know, the bill uh, provides uh, subsidies uh, uh, to encourage people to buy insurance, so that could be uh, one of the carrots. Oh, and w go ahead, Greg. Aside from the theater of this, of these here and around the country, I mean, is there anything, uh, you know, substantive coming out of this that, that, that the congressmen are, are taking away from it or that the people who go are, are feeling good about it? I mean, what's, you know, the, the thing that gets the most publicity is the raucousness, but right. is there any real substance going on? I, you know, I think that the biggest substance is the tone. I think it's they're getting the uh, uh, temperature of their constituents. Or they're, they're understanding what issues matter to them. Uh, in terms of practical policies that they, they can take back, or uh, I haven't seen much of anything. But in terms of positions that their constituents would like, I've seen a whole lot more. Mm -hmm. Lori? In terms of uh, holding these meetings, is it sort of for these congressmen uh, is it sort of damned if you do, damned if you don't? Uh, would you be criti criticized if you don't schedule them? But boy, if you hold them, then your then your antagonists outnumber your supporters. Is is it sort of a can't win? Well, you know, as uh, Hunter had his event at a music hall, which was kind of appropriate because he had to face the music on it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, uh, you know, it, it's it's one of those things where if they don't have these sorts of meetings, you know, come November next year, they're it gives opponents, opponents are a, gonna, gives know, them a club up. to They're beat them say, with. You know, where were yeah. you? Uh, you weren't listening to us, yeah. and you know, you've been uh, ignoring us, and yeah. now you want another two yeah, years. Yeah, we're clamoring for meetings, and you won't even come out. Let's exactly. for equal time here. Let's give a, a bite from uh, Hunter here on that same issue regarding the uh, health care. If we demonopolize it, we allow any insurance company to pop up, different hospitals to pop up, without a federal overarching tyranny over it, we will have less expensive insurance, less expensive health care, and things will be better. Now you hear a little more of the noise there. The folks uh, at least uh, let ISIS speak. Now these, we should note, these are two different congressmen politically in that the, the uh, ISA in East County is a pretty safe district here. I'm sorry, uh, Hunter in East County. ISA barely squeaked through, a very, very close vote. Took a while to even count the votes here. And he's got to basically come back to, to the middle because the opponents are lining up against both of these folks, especially ISA. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, you know, ISA's uh, race last year against uh, Doug Applegate, who is running against him again, was the closest race in the country by any sort of uh, way that you look at it. Uh, it was 1,600 votes. Uh, that's nothing. Uh, and uh, he has a second challenger as well, Mike Levin, an Orange County Democrat mm -hmm. who is entering the race. Uh, uh, Levin's, you know, an environmental uh, attorney, and he previously ran the Orange County Democrats. So, you know, he knows the, the area as well. It's not, um, mm -hmm. it's not like last year when the race really started to begin the day after the primary mm -hmm. when Applegate was so close. Now, it's you, much challengers earlier. have yeah. 20 months to plan, right. to fundraise, to uh, attack ISA. It's a much different. And uh, even even uh, Hunter's getting some again the safe district, but he's getting some uh, opposition already too. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, we'll see that as we go along next year. Going to be a very interesting election year, and it'll be upon us before we know it. Mm -hmm. We've got to move on to our next segment. The Navy's ongoing Fat Leonard bribery scandal keeps expanding like a sumo wrestler's waistline. Nine more Navy officers and an admiral included were indicted this week on bribery, conspiracy, and other charges. Uh, Greg, start by reminding us who Fat Leonard is. We love the colorful name uh, here. And it's a big scandal, it though. Is. It's been going on a long he's, time. He's a big man, and this is a, a, a big deal for the Navy. Fat Leonard is the nickname that is in all the court documents and that. Uh, was the nickname of a guy named Leonard Glenn Francis. He was the chief executive and the owner of a, of a company called Glenn Defense Marine Asia. This is a, a company that's in the ship husbanding uh, business. They're defense contractors that basically uh, sign contracts with uh, the Navy so that when Navy ships pull into foreign ports and they need fuel and water and ground transportation and all kinds of things, 
the local uh, husbander will provide those. Mm -hmm. um, now we do have, just to, to bolster what you're saying here, a clip from, uh, from Glenn Marine on what they do, a little promotion right. report. Let's hear that. Its scale of operations spans 54 million square miles. Represented by a global network of nine regional offices that have operated in more than 32 countries. Its specialized team of professionals is dedicated to providing unrivaled value to its clients in the areas of naval fleet support, total marine husbanding, and passenger cruise terminal operation. Well, some of those clients uh, got a little more they, than they, they even did. bargained for, didn't they? What's the government's uh, main uh, overview on it's their the, case? The, the, the nut of this case, which is now entering its fourth year, is pretty simple. Leonard would get his hooks into uh, officers in the Navy on these ships by bribing them or giving them gifts, incredibly expensive dinners, uh, expensive watches, free travel, paid for their hotel rooms, and many, many uses of prostitutes. And in exchange, they would essentially advance his interests in within the Navy by uh, advocating that Glenn Defense get certain contracts, that the, that and most importantly, that the Navy ships go to ports across Asia where Glenn Defense was established and uh, controlling could, all the services. Controlling the services, and that was important for Leonard because then he could execute the point of the scheme, which was to overbill and defraud the Navy of tens of millions of dollars. Yeah, now that's my next question, the scope of this. We're talking about a lot of money here in this in this bribery scheme. Not only money, but time. So this went on for, I, I think, at least a decade, maybe longer. Uh, he has, Leonard has, uh, Francis has pleaded guilty, did so several years ago by now, and has been cooperating since. And in his guilty plea agreement, uh, they sort of acknowledge about $35 million in ill-gotten gains from this scheme. I think everybody thinks that is not the total nut, that that's, that's got to be a lot more. Than yeah, that. so it's not over even though the fat Leonard is singing. Now, uh, how many, we had a bunch of indictments this week. The big thing that caught the, the headline was the Admiral here. What uh, what were yeah, some of the well, specifics there? Yes, this it was a very interesting, it's a 78-page indictment. It's the longest and most detailed indictment that's been issued so far in this case. 25, 26 people have been charged so far. Um, th yeah, the top line here was a fellow named, uh, excuse me, Bruce Loveless, who retired uh, from the Navy last October as a rear admiral. He was the director of naval intelligence. Uh, it rose to a very high level in the, in the Pentagon and in the service. Uh, the, he is charged in the indictment for conduct that occurred in like 2007, 2008, when he was a captain in the Navy, mm -hmm. uh, and where he availed himself of Leonard's largesse, which included free hotel rooms, nice dinners, and prostitutes. And there's some graphic stuff in this, uh, in there this is, latest there court is filing. There is very salacious stuff about uh, assignations with prostitutes in hotel rooms. That is a phrase of the rotating carousel of prostitutes, mm -hmm. which I think will go down in mm -hmm. naval history, as well as uh, a raging multi-day sex party right. in one of the hotels. All right, Brad? I, it always boggles my mind when there's scandals of this size. And in your reporting, do you have any idea of, like, how did it get this far? How are there this many people? At yeah, where's the levels? auditors? Where, the where are the auditors, the safeguards? Yeah. yeah, exactly. I think there are two answers to that. One is, is that throughout the pendency of this, there were people within the Navy, within the service, who were shooting up flares to NCIS and to other people saying, look, we're getting gouged by this guy. Do something with this guy. But he had uh, <coughs> enough uh, people kind of on his payroll who would run interference for him who would he had one of the people who was indicted and has already pleaded guilty in this was an actual NCIS agent mm -hmm. who was feeding him confidential information about the investigations this was a very the don had a lot of buffers he did he had <laughs> and he had he knew exactly where he was going he targeted people on the command staffs uh, of the of the of the of the fleet this was in the seventh fleet who who had this ability and this influence to to kind of direct ships or have some input into where the ships go. He had somebody watching his six in the, uh, telling him who was investigating and who was not. He had these other people who, when competitors would complain about him, would run down competitors and challenge people in the Navy about why they're favoring him. So that was one. The other one is, uh, I was told, I did a, a large take on this about a year ago, that the Navy has, you know, the ship husbanding business has really grown a lot as the Navy has kind of cut back on providing those services itself. Mm -hmm. And while that part of it expanded, they didn't ex expand kind of the back shop. The they, they, they cut the auditors, they the cut the investigators, did, and they haven't done it. Did any of the, um, not so much of the financial stuff, but in the course of this, before these more detailed indictments came out, did any of the parting and expensive uh, entertainment, any of that salacious stuff leak out? 
in the rumor mill, or was that pretty tightly wrapped until oh, the indictment? I, I've gotten the impression that if you were in the Pacific uh, uh, and pulling into ports, you knew you knew who Leonard was. He was, he was guy. a well-known guy who was always there on the pier with a big bottle of yeah. Chivas or something, and yeah. you know, hell fell well met. Uh, I think it, I think it would be hard to keep that entirely secret. Although a big part of this indictment and these other indictments is the steps that they took to conceal uh, their involvement with, with All right, America. well, we'll see what happens as these cases move, move through here and a lot more to come on that story. Uh, in an alluring pitch for those planning a trip to San Diego, a stay in style downtown in an apartment with dazzling views, luxury kitchens and baths, a fancy gym, an easy walk to find restaurants and bars, a hot market has sprung up for luxury pads rented by the night, a practice that's controversial and likely illegal. Uh, Lori, how are these folks hooking up with travelers looking for a place to stay? Well, our favorite uh, online platforms, things like Airbnb, v VRBO, and a uh, website I hadn't been familiar with until the story called Stay Alfred. Mm -hmm. um, and so there, they were finding them. And when you go on Airbnb, less so for VRBO, when you go on Airbnb, you can't really necessarily tell or look for an apartment. You're just looking, so you're thinking you're getting a a condo or a home, you don't you don't know what you're getting, and only, they're not giving addresses. And they don't give addresses. So, um, and and on the other sites, um, you you I mean, excuse me, on Airbnb, you cannot search apartment; it, mm -hmm. they won't let you. So, mm -hmm. it was kind of difficult to even find where they are. But but word of mouth, we learned that there were a lot of these. Yeah. Now, how does this? How much do they go for each night? Some of these luxury places down there. We saw some as low as 115, but a lot of them are going to go 200, Several maybe as high as three. 300 a night, but of course you get a you can get a unit with more people that can stay in it. All right, and most of the leases prohibit this this uh, nightly rental activity, right? Right, right, and even one major landlord uh, has sued Airbnb over this, but yeah, they do. Except, you know, we were hearing though that maybe some landlords are claiming that you know it's not allowed, but they're kind of in cahoots with it because you know it takes a while to fill these high rises with. With hundreds of units, uh, I, we can never substantiate that. But um, that and so they might be wetting their beaks too, or just just a way to get some revenue during that long lease-up period for mm -hmm. a for a high rise. All right, now our, our new city attorney, Mara Elliott, she's issued an opinion <gasps> which which kind of is differs from what's been considered in the past regarding uh, the fact this isn't really permitted here in San Diego. Yeah, now that's an even bigger issue, and that's all going to come to head right. next Friday when there's a council committee hearing. But yes, uh, all her, her previous predecessors all said that the law is just very unclear on this, but she's saying we have a what's called a permissive zoning ordinance, and if it's not listed in the zoning ordinance, it's not permitted. Short-term rentals aren't listed, so therefore they're illegal. That doesn't mean tomorrow the police are going to come knocking on your, or city enforcement's going to start knocking on your door, but um, that sets the stage for an even more urgent need to the city to start regulating these. I thought okay, that was Greg? interesting. What what prompted that memo? Did, did, it, did, it, did was there an inquiry from the council? Was she it? she in part ran on a platform that she was going to address short term rentals. The critics there's a group called Save San Diego Neighborhoods that have been pushing pushing pushing. They pushed Jan Goldsmith, her predecessor, and they pushed her to get an opinion out. And and then the actual formal inquiry came from Councilwoman Barbara Bree, who also ran on this, saying, "Could you tell us are these legal or not?" Mm -hmm. And that's where it came from. And, and now you're getting your share of complaints, are you not? From we're not just downtown, but from these oh. rental situations all across the uh, the area. Right? Plenty of complaints, and the city just doesn't have the code enforcement staff to respond to them. And even if they did, the people that are complaining say, you know, by the time you call anybody, it's too late. It just that's not the way to handle this. They've moved on, Joshua. What's their contention? What's <clears throat> their problem with these sorts of sorts of rentals? What are they criticizing them for? So the biggest criticism is not the kind of person that rents out a room. Uh, their spare bedroom, but the people, more the commercial investors, people who have multiple units, mm. who are, it's become a business rather than buying a place, fixing it up and renting it out to a long-term tenant. They're doing it for these short-term rentals and a lot of late night parties, vacationers, when you're on vacation, you want to let loose and so you don't have to be college kids, it can be anybody and so it's very loud for the next door neighbors. That's the biggest complaint, it's disrupted a peaceful single family neighborhood. And apartment owners must get the complaints. You say some early on in a given situation might be in cahoots, but your story even mentioned one that was thinking of just building an apartment and renting it out just by the night, not even having regular leases. Right. Well, he, yeah, this uh, developer said in Little Italy said that, 
he can make more money doing that than um, long-term leases. So, uh, so next week, we're going to have the city council to take this up in, in committee. Is that going to be, as we were saying well, earlier, a 15-hour hearing? Third or fourth, <laughs> yes, because this is, this is about the fourth time they've done this because there is no consensus, um, maybe with the new council, but there's been no consensus. And it always has been at least six, seven-hour hearing, and both sides with mm -hmm. equal numbers mm -hmm. come Brett? show up. And a big player in this is the hotel industry, right? <laughs> that In your story, they had the... the the study that was yeah, you know what's direct competitors. You right? know what's interesting is nationally, the hotel industry has been a big player, but when I've gone to all these hearings, the hotel industry's been very low key about it. They haven't made a big deal about it. Frankly, the hotel industry is doing quite well right now in San Diego and elsewhere, but it's it, the real foes of this. You're right, the hotels, but there haven't been the real foes in San Diego. It's been these single family neighborhoods. All right, we're out of time, but we're gonna look forward to your story next week and see what happens as the uh, council takes this thing up. Well, that wraps up our St. Patty's Day edition, another week of stories on the KPBS Roundtable. I'd like to thank my guests, Lori Weisberg of the San Diego Union Tribune, Brad Racino of iNewsource, Greg Moran, also of the Union Tribune, and just to round it out, Joshua Stewart, also of the Union Tribune. A reminder, all the stories we discussed today are available on our website, kpbs.org. I'm Mark Sauer. Thanks for joining us today on the Roundtable. <laughs>